Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for Prolonging Work, Supports to Keep You on the Job. My name is Elizabeth Jennings, and I work for National Disability Institute, and we're thrilled that you were able to join us today. This agenda includes um, some housekeeping tips from my colleague, Nakia Matthews, an overview of financial wellness survey results and the importance of economic empowerment, great tips on prolonging work by Dr. Kenneth Mitchell, a special guest who's going to offer her peer perspective and some suggested next steps. I'm going to over to Nakia so she can give you some advice on how to listen to the webinar and how to ask questions. Everyone, the offer for today's webinar is being broadcast through your computer. Please make sure your speaker is turned on and your headphones are turned up. You can control the audio broadcast via the audio broadcast panel, which you can see a photo of here. If you accidentally close this panel, you can reopen it from the top menu by going to communicate and then join audio broadcast. If you're listening to the webinar today via phone only, or if you do not have sound capabilities on your computer, you can dial one eight seven seven six six eight four four nine eight. 4490 with the meeting code of 969-627-576, and not need an attendee ID. In the right-hand corner of your screen, you'll see a media viewer window. There we have captioning available for participants who are deaf, hard of hearing, or where English is a second language. If you don't want to see this window, you can uh, collapse the media viewer window, or if you'd like to make the media viewer window bigger, you can collapse some of the other panels like participants, and chat. If you experience any technical difficulties, you can send, uh, send a message to me via the chat box or you can email our host, Elizabeth Jennings, ejennings at ndi-inc.org. At the end of the presentations, we're going to have a little bit of Q&A, questions and answers. And throughout the webinar, you can send any questions you have to either me, the host, or Elizabeth Jennings via the chat box or the Q&A. Box. If you are by phone or you're not logged into the webinar, you can also ask questions emailing Elizabeth Jennings directly, again at ejenningsndi-inc.org. Please note this webinar is being recorded and the materials will be placed on the NDI website at realeconomicimpact.org. Before we started today, we'd like to say a special thank you to our sponsor, Accorda Therapeutics. Through Accorda Therapeutics, this financial webinar series has been made possible, and we're appreciative to them of their support. So just to remind you, today we're going to focus on prolonging work support. And we're going to start off with an overview of financial wellness and some of the relative strategies that we've been talking about through the first webinar and through the webinars that are still to come. We're also going to have Kenneth Mitchell here to talk to you about thinking differently about work and supports to keep you on the job. Then we're going to hear from Nicole Lamel, who's going to provide a peer perspective on what we've discussed today. At, we're going to look at some suggested next steps. These are a few things that we would like to recommend that you consider doing over the next few months practical steps that you could use to apply the knowledge that you learned today, and then we hope that you'll get back to us on how successful you are. And round out today's event with a question and answer period so we can address any of the questions that you may have. But don't worry, if you're not, um, if you're not ready to ask questions today, you can always reach out to myself, Elizabeth Jennings, and any questions that I can't answer, I'll pass on to Dr. Mitchell for you. So let's start off by talking a little bit about what is financial wellness. Now you've looked a lot at your general wellness, meaning your health, but also hope that you'll think about your financial wellness. And what we mean by financial wellness is the state of your finances with the intent of working towards changing financial behaviors so that you can limit stress and the impact of stress on your daily life. 
shows that when your finances are a point of stress, it can negatively impact other aspects of your life, including your health. You that there are many components to financial wellness, including being financially literate, and some of you may have joined us last week for our Being Money Smart. Also, accessing affordable financial services, utilizing favorable tax provisions, which we'll talk about later in the series, budgeting, understanding public benefit rules. If you have already registered, then you might want to consider registering for one of our next two series which understanding Social Security Disability Insurance and understanding Supplemental Security Income, building and maintaining assets, accessing available health care subsidies, and understanding the impact of work on long-term disability, which we'll be talking a bit about today. I'll share with you some poverty estimates. It's for those age 18 to 64, um, in 2010 is when these numbers come from. Individuals without disabilities across the country lived below the poverty level at a rate of 12.8%. Individuals with disabilities, that rate was more than twice that amount. It was 27.3%. We know there are a lot of talk about economic recovery, but really there's no group in America more in need than individuals with disabilities as evidenced by their high rate of poverty. Millions of working age adults with disabilities, as many of you may know, when you look to public benefits, income, health care, food, housing, it becomes a trap that requires you to have limited income and limited savings in order to remain eligible. One of the things that we're going to talk about over the next two webinars is how it if you are someone who's receiving a public benefit, like Social Security benefits, how we can show you ways that you can work and earn and even save and maintain some or all of your public benefits. So is financial wellness important? Well, for one, it impacts your mental and physical health. Some may know that as you experience financial stress, it can impact your health negatively. It also impacts your self-concept. There's a lot of pride in being somebody who goes to work, who pays their bills, and when those opportunities are taken from you, that can have a negative spin on how you view yourself. It changes your status with other community stakeholders. As many on the line may know, even the option of going out to be part of the community, to participate in community events, can have a cost attached to it if you're in need of paratransit services or other support in participating in community life. And overall, it directly impacts your quality of life. One of the things that we're hoping folks will take from this webinar series is that you'll start to think about how your finances impact your quality of life and in what areas there can be change made and in what areas we'll need to look to other supports. We started this webinar series last year. We did a survey with our partners at MSAA so we could better understand the state of finances among people with MS and have an idea about what kind of learning tools would be um, sufficient and helpful. And this is part of what we found out. We found out that more than half of the households surveyed earn less than 35000 annually. We asked about individuals, their ability to pay their bills on time in a typical month. As you can see, almost half reported a somewhat difficult time, but 82% said they had a very difficult time paying their bills in a typical month. Also, 43% of respondents reported that their financial status had affected their ability to access medical care at some point. We learned that um, more, almost two-thirds, over 71% of people, did not have enough savings to cover three months' expenses. Just to side note, this is an important question because in most financial stability um, products or services, they see that an individual's ability to save three months of expenses is key to them being financially stable. Um, at, since the financial down 
term, they've actually said that people should have six months of expenses in the bank. Um, the respondents that we surveyed, um, the majority did not have three months available to them. We found that a large majority, 67%, reported that their finances were worse since their MS diagnosis. And almost 273% reported that they were not aware or had not used several financial stability programs, including the Earned Income Tax Credit, which is EITC, IAs, which are Individual Development Accounts, SS, which is Family Self-Sufficiency Programs, and PASS, which is Plan for Achieving Self-Support. Each of these stability programs are one we will be discussing in future webinars. So if you're on the line and you don't know what they mean either, just keep joining us and we'll we'll advise you on them as we progress in the series. Actually, a lot of strategies that are available to individuals to improve their financial wellness, and we gave you a grid of those. The ones in greens are one that we've discussed in the first webinar. The one in blue, employment, we'll be talking about today. And the majority of the other ones we will be discussing in subsequent webinars. I still don't need to read them to you, as most of you on the line can see them, but I'm going to go over them just in case for people who are not able to join us but via computer but had to join by phone. So the strategies that we want you to consider are financial literacy, budgeting, credit repair, getting banked, meaning banking with somebody who provides affordable financial services, Using work incentives, which we'll discuss in the next two webinars. Use tax incentives. Adding volunteer income tax assistance programs. Claim your earned income tax credit. About and enrolling with state Medicaid buy-in programs. Family self-sufficiency programs. Use individual development accounts. Adding assistive technology loan funds. Utilize student loans, planning investments and retirement accounts, and assets that we think you should consider building if you're able to are post-secondary education, employment, self-employment, microenterprise, home ownership, and investment and retirement accounts. The grid are sources of support, which include protection and advocacy which are organizations that are available in every state, Their advocates through the IRS, counseling services, volunteer income tax assistance sites, and benefits planning. The wellness strategies are new to a lot of people, and it's something that you're not typically talked to about as you join the community of individuals with disabilities. So if you are curious about any of these strategies, even and before we get to a webinar, I encourage you to reach out to me. I'll provide some input or advise you to, as to which webinar to register for. And at any point in time, if you need more information, I encourage you to reach out to us. I'd like to introduce to you Dr. Kenneth Mitchell. He's a managing partner with Work Prescription Group Limited in Worthington, Ohio, and we're very pleased to have him joining us today to talk to you about work health and multiple sclerosis. Thanks a lot, Elizabeth. Uh, I'm looking forward to the opportunity of sharing with you uh, the various uh, points of view that I've uh, been able to develop over the past uh, some years in working with individuals of both the individuals and trying to stay at work as well as employers attempting to, uh, to support a person's uh, uh, continuing their work uh, during and following any work disruptions that they may have. So, from that standpoint, my, my intent today is to share with you some of the things I've learned, some of the things I've learned from individuals that have uh, multiple sclerosis and have been able to uh, sustain their employment, and also give you a plan because I think, in, in overall, the whole, uh, 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 the whole uh, asset that you bring to, the, to this particular situation is your ability to plan, your ability to organize and begin to anticipate uh, uh, issues that may come up. And so I talk about work health, the multiple sclerosis, really an exercise in good judgment and decision-making. I think that's uh, really the essence of where I'd like to go today because 
we know that uh, a return to work plan and staying at work is really the product of, of good judgment and decision making. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, what I'd like to be able to do is really start looking at the big picture. Uh, that is, start to focus on good judgment and making decisions. Uh, the first thing that we invite a person to do is figure out what they are in a currently a uh, if they are currently involved in a work health predicament. Um, and, and what that what that means to me is that there is a collision between someone's health and, and the health uh, status that they have right now. Uh, it may be a not be a crisis, but it may be a situation where they can start seeing a, emerging problems that may be arising, either due to strength, endurance, um, uh, overall decision making ability at the, or cognitive functioning at work. The idea is is to begin to anticipate the types of predicaments that may arise and then be conscious of the predicament that the person may be in. One of the questions I always ask an individual that is struggling with staying at work or returning to work is, how did you get into this predicament? And oftentimes they'll say, well, I, I had nothing to do with this. Uh, I really didn't. Um, there's nothing to do about it. The, the disease just kept emerging. It kept progressing, and I just got where I'm at today, and I'm stuck. Well, that's probably correct, but the the important thing is that if a person feels like they are stuck or, in fact, are stuck, that we have to look at how to get unstuck. And that is uh, there's a certain part of uh, moving forward that we can we can coach a person on to help uh, move them from being stuck to unstuck. And what starts is, is taking a look at that predicament they're in, they're in. How did you get in it? So what's important to me at this point in time? What has to change and what can change? Uh, this becomes now a process of deciding what's important and what's not important, what uh, capacity you have to uh, create various options. What I like to do then is to be able to enhance those capacities to solve that work health predicament because it's a predicament. Uh, it may be a family issue, it may be an employee issue, it may be a, a variety of other people's issues, but uh, the habit is it's, it's your predicament and you have to you have to become a, a combo for solving that particular predicament you're in. And so from that standpoint, what we ask a person to do is begin to define the direction you want to go into. Uh, where do we need to go? What needs to be done? What are the issues that have to be paid attention to? Uh, then we want to look at the values that you have. How important is work to you? Uh, is it absolutely critical? Is it vital? Is it part of your essence, a part of your soul? Uh, or is it some place to be? Uh, and from this particular standpoint, uh, work is in probably, if not the most important source of income that the person may have. So maintaining that employment, maintaining that financial stability is obviously very critical. Then what we want to do is look at how you make decisions. Are you able to gather information? Are you able to uh, sort out information from that's real, uh, that's accurate, from just uh, myths or uh, false information that one may find? Uh, and uh, what kind of barriers stand in the way of, of uh, solving this particular predicament? And ultimately, that starts with the type of vision that you have. And that is, do you have the capacity to look at the big picture, that long-term uh, long consequences of what you're doing today and how they may affect you tomorrow? And we'll show you a slide in a minute that begins to calibrate where your where your planning horizon is at. And then what we'll do is ask you to develop a change plan. And that is basically an incremental, a series of incremental steps that you're moving forward to begin getting you unstuck or begin to solve that predicament you're in. To do that, we ask you to start talking about and creating what-if options. And these what-if options are basically what, what if this happens, what if that happens. Now, sometimes people don't like to think about these things, but that's oftentimes the source of why they get into predicament is they haven't thought about them. Now, we're not talking about an obsessive sense of worry. We're not talking about an obsessive sense of of, uh, of um, pessimism on this, but the understanding of what the options are if certain issues come up. Sometimes we call this fire drill counseling. The uh, idea is, is that you begin to look at doing a fire drill. You're, not, not, you're preparing if a fire occurs. You're preparing if this crisis occurs so you know what to do. And so when a person has multiple sclerosis, this is certainly in the early stages, 
uh, we, we're at a point in time where you can begin to define what ifs, is that now then, then you can create the solutions if those things do actually happen. And then obviously we always want the person to continue to evaluate, adapt, and realign. When we talk about adjustments, and I think that's always a, a term that people don't like to hear, I, I've adjusted to the multiple sclerosis, I've adjusted to this disability, I've adjusted to this particular condition, and people don't like that. Well, I like the term adjustment or readjustment. I like to use the term realignment. That is, you realign your values, you realign your goals, you realign the process of achieving those goals because it's reality. And a person that doesn't realign based on different things going on in their line, uh, in, in their life will become stuck and will have difficulty uh, adapting to, to the whole overall process. Next slide, please. This is an illustration related to the whole idea of planning. And you kind of pick where you're at. Uh, uh, the person who is the only plans for tomorrow, well, they miss a lot of opportunities, and those are the people that they get stuck. They're the ones who don't really think about where they need to be at uh, next week, next month, or next year. And so it just begins to calibrate the opportunity for your planning and where you fit into this particular process. Some say, well, I can't, I can't plan, do long-term planning because I just don't know what the disease is going to do for me or have an impact on me. Well, uh, that's probably accurate, but the idea is you still can plan. You still can focus, but you can always then realign. Now, I enjoy those people that are the, the big thinkers, the long-term horizon people, the people that often talk about being in the clouds. Well, that, that's also interesting to talk with those people, but also they're no different than the person who's just looking at tomorrow because they're not paying attention to what needs to be done. They're looking off, they're dreaming, they're off into some type of fantasy land. And so we need to have that middle-of-the-road planning for not only next month, uh, but also next year. Next slide, please. Work and health are connected. There's no two ways about that. Our research, our experience says that that uh, the two are so connected that when you maintain your health, you're able to maintain your work. If work gets rust disrupted, it affects your health, both physical and emotional as well as economic. And when we talk about these connections, we, we invite the person to begin to sort out what means for them. And the first thing I like to do in, in working with an individual and also working with an employer is to begin to understand the, the, the work health myths that are out there. And one of the most important ones that I think people make is that they make a decision, and I, it's really a premature decision, that I've got this diagnosis of multiple sclerosis and I won't be able to work. Um, or you have a, an employer and says, well, this person has multiple sclerosis or any type of uh, 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 health condition, they can't work. And that's a myth. Uh, and, and the idea behind that is that the person says, I can't, if I can't do 100% of my job, I can't do any of that. That's one common myth that employers and individuals come to the premature conclusion about, and it oftentimes affects their long-term ability to sustain employment and the long-term ability to have a per, an employer hire individuals to maintain a people's involvement. And so that standpoint, the remainder of these types of connections often uh, deal with very specific areas. And let me just touch on those as we go through there. And you'll see where you fit in terms of the types of decisions, the type of judgment you have in, in looking at the nature of your work, the capacity to work. First of all, well, I, we want to find out and have the person explore as accurate as possible what's the implications of the multiple sclerosis, the treatment, not only the disease, but the treatment. How does that affect your work capacity? Um, and this includes everything from medications, uh, strength and endurance, and obviously mobility. Uh, so from that standpoint, those are important aspects that need to be monitored, that need to be assessed, uh, so that you constantly have a, a, a good accurate understanding of what you have going for you in terms of work capacity. And that's important is because we have a formula that's very simple that work capacity should equal job demands. And if there's a gap between those, then that's where a person gets in trouble at the workplace. And so we want to maintain a little gap between what a person's work capacities are and what the job demands are. And we'll show you a little chart in a minute that helps, uh, helps you kind of figure out how to do that. One of the areas that we want to pay attention to is that oftentimes with a, a chronic disease like multiple sclerosis, you have points of acceptation 
remissions and, and points of, of uh, remissions. And so you might have uh, you might have uh, some of the consequences may be that you have the opportunity to have a work disruption, uh, a break in employment. What does that mean to you? Is that something you can work around? Is that something your employment can return uh, has to work around? What's the reality of that? And so I'm always uh, make want to make sure that the employee and the employer, along with their physician and their, and their treatment partners, is to understand what happens if I have a break in, in my employment. What are the benefits? Uh, what does it do to my seniority? What does it do for my overall skill level and my team my team level that I might be working with? One of the fortunate things is I've, I've worked with people who are self-employed and they, they have an exacerbation of the uh, of the symptoms of multiple sclerosis and they decide, well, this is it, I'm going to sell my business. And which, or they quit or they think they're going to go on disability and retirement and then all of a sudden things change. And what they've done is they really have made a premature decision that's got them in now a, a real predicament. And so from that standpoint, breaks in employment are important. And obviously, you, uh, when a person makes a decision about continuing work versus leaving work, what are they, not only the health consequences, but what are economic consequences? We'll talk a little bit in the, as, as I close my discussion this morning or this afternoon on the whole nature of this insurance. Um, it's an important part of a person's life. Uh, disability insurance can be an important lifeboat, financial lifeboat. It also can be an important way of sustaining employment because most disability insurers have programs to help support a person during periods of, of um, breaks in their employment. And the areas I look at in the work health connections are the potential work health barriers. And I refer to these as the, the cornerstones of the cornerstone barriers to, to staying at work and returning to work. I'm going to mention them because they oftentimes are very common with individuals who have injuries, who have illnesses, who have chronic health problems. And these four conditions are ambiguity. Uh, that is, they're, they're, they're not sure that things are unclear. That may be uh, related to the diagnosis. It may be related to the treatment. It may be related to the outcomes. But the ambiguity is that it can be a very difficult a bit to overcome because it leaves people in a quandary. They're not sure what to do. Vivalence, on the other hand, is that push-pull. That is, there's conflict. I want to work. I don't want to work. I can work, but I'm not sure if I can work. It's proverbial rock between a rock and a hard place. It's yes, I want to, but. And that ambivalence can be very, very uh, debilitating to an individual because the, the stronger the ambivalence, the greater the push and pull, uh, the either or, and oftentimes people get stuck by this ambivalence and become immobilized, paralyzed, if you will. Resistance and fear uh, are important, and what the common common denominator there is basically resistance and fear to change. Now, in many types of chronic health problems, there are there is change in the physical structure of what you can do and 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 how you get around. That's a reality. Uh, through treatment, through uh, these, uh, one minimize that to some degree. But what we want to do is uh, in, in create a process by which the person is not resistant to change or fears to change, but embraces it and creates strategies to mold the change to their particular benefit, to mold it to their particular direction they'd like to go. And the other issues of work health connections are more practical. That is, what information needs to be shared with my employer? And that information is medical information, diagnosis, symptoms, things like that. Obviously, privacy is very important. But we find that employers need to understand what the con conditions are. Uh, and in most cases, when they do understand, they're very likely to be cooperative and collaborate with you to protect and sustain your employ employability. Now, if you're an employee that has performance problems, that you haven't been successful, that may change the equation of a, a person's willingness to to uh, to support and accommodate. Now, they can't do that because the American Disability Act, it does, it's not dependent on whether they like you or not. It's not dependent if you're a strong performer or a good performer or an okay performer or a bad performer. But the idea is that you as the individual need to make some decisions about the type of information you want to share with your employer. And that may mean with uh, um, uh, that mean with coworkers, it may mean with supervisors, uh, but certainly a discussion needs to be established 
established with uh, an, uh, with a, a, a a very senior person within an organization. That, by senior, I don't mean just co colleagues. I'm meaning uh, such things as a senior occupational health nurse, a senior human resource manager, so that they're in a or in combination with your physician, they're able to explain what the conditions are. You can explain the accommodations that are necessary. And my experience over so many years has been that employers are typically very responsive to that. And if they're not, there probably is a reason for it. It may not be a good reason, but there is a reason. And then finally, when we talk about employer discussions, what we want to be able to think about is what transitions are possible. What incremental change may be located within a workplace to accommodate uh, periods of, of uh, exacerbation or periods of remission. And so that's an important part of that discussion with the employer. And the remainder of these things that we have identified here are uh, all relate to things about expectations. What you want to do and what you need to do to sustain your employment. And those expectations can be shared in terms of that discussion with the employer and your coworkers. Maybe your team, the team you're working with, need to make accommodations to cover for you sometimes or other to help during times of treatment, times that you might not be physically able to do certain things. But those are negotiated. Those are things that are not be, that you don't just show up one day and say, I need this. You try to do this ahead of time. You try to plan for this in a way that gives you some idea of some control and influence on that process. And then finally, uh, we talk about post-work plan. Uh, well, oftentimes people don't like to think about this, that they, that they continue to work forever. At some point in time, it, that, that, that it be because of the disease or the disability or the level of function you have, and be to your advantage to decide that work and what you're doing right now is not something that I need to continue or should continue. What's the plan after that? It's just someone who decides to retire, uh, not necessarily medically retire, but just retire. There's a transition that goes on. And so being able to think about it and plan that post-work plan, whether it's age 65 or at 55 or at 45, the thoughtfulness put behind it allows you to create a, a, a series of expectations that can be met and, and, and anticipate any changes that may not be able to met and come up with solutions to them. Next slide, please. Part your work health, uh, sustaining your work health uh, relationship, and that's really today. Um, time you have a diagnosis. It may even start at the time you have symptoms and you're not sure what's going on. As you begin to think about the potential impact of this, you may not know exactly where it's going to go, and you probably likely will not know over time. Uh, and so from that standpoint, but you can start today and think differently about the relationship between you, your work, and your health. And when you think differently, what that means is you're not a victim, and you're not uh, drifting off based on uh, things in your life that you have no control over. We want you to be as a planner, the driver, the influence, certainly not a spectator to this whole thing. We want you to be able to be in control of the process of making sure that you're able to be part, to be the principal decision maker on the employment uh, activities that you're engaged in. Now, you may not have the final decision because uh, there may be an employer or a group of people that will make a decision along with you, but in fact, you need to be not a spectator, but an active participant. Now, we're going to get into some of the more specifics that I think that are going to be useful. And let's identify just a couple areas real quickly. Uh, the, 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 as I mentioned before, job demands and capacities is a very important uh, equation. And we'll show you how you might want to do this in an organizational way, an organized way, that help you to identify things that need to be done very specifically. Uh, and then what we can do to talk about then is having a plan B uh, and, and the type of financial coverage if, if the financial issues are, are, are to the point where you have to go on disability insurance or that's the best path for you to go at this particular time. Just let me make one comment here on the last bullet. This is something that I, I uh, when I work with individuals and I work uh, with employers who are dealing with individuals that are uh, having some type of health issues, is to remember that hope and panic are not strategies. There are more responses uh, to an event. Uh, we can hope that you'll get better. We can hope that you'll be able to sustain, some, stay in employment, but it won't get you far. You can look at things and you could uh, get very excited. You could get very stressed out. You can panic. Once again, that's not a strategy. 
the strategy we're looking for here is a planned and thoughtful way of making decisions about where you want to go and what you're able to do in managing the effects of the multiple sclerosis. Next slide, please. One of the ways we do this is we invite employers to create this type of matrix, if you will, or table, uh, however you want to refer to it. But simply what it does, it just creates creates two two directions. One is you have your job demands. That is, uh, uh, is the job demand necessary? Is it frequent? Uh, do you do it sometimes or do you never do it? And then we look at the work capacities. Now, I'm not talking here about general work capacities. The ones listed here are very specific related to that are may be affected by multiple sclerosis. There's memory, strength, mobility, uh, visual spatial relationships, focus and concentration, reaction time, communication, endurance. This also uh, can re be related to such things as chemo brain, or someone that's going through cancer treatment uh, and are going through chemotherapy. They may have those therapy may still have may have the same effects on these types of functions. And add as many different functions on here or work capacities based on job. But these are ones I just selected just for illustration. And what I've done here is you can see in, in terms of memory, uh, it's necessary function. Um, uh, and, and you can see under visual spatial, that's a necessary function. You can see under communication, this is a necessary function in this particular job. This job can't be done without that particular function of being able to be done. Now you can see in my first my first column outside the work capacities, is there an impairment? Is there an existing situation that suggests that this person has not uh, there's some effect on their memory, on their strength, and mobility? We the first three where there is an impairment uh, that's that's measurable. Uh, only one out of this would be uh, in terms of memory is that that may be a, a, a issue we need to deal with. What kind of adjustments do we need to do uh, in, in relationship to the nature and scope of this particular job? Under visual spatial, this has uh, necessary, but there's no impairment, so it's not a problem. When we get down to when we down to the area, I've lost the screen here. No, thank you very much. Um, uh, the idea here is that uh, uh, insurance seems to be the most critical issue in this whole area. It's necessary. And there's probably some significant uh, significant impairment in that particular area. The remainder of these are either might be issues or possible issues or, or no issues. And so this is the type of specificity that you can help uh, an employer, and we hope the employer will be able to provide this type of information. But this type of demonstration allows you to look very specifically at a particular job, a particular set of job demands, and then be able to look at the work capacities and the type of impairment or uh, sustained uh, uh, function that you might have in that particular area. And then you can determine, is this a problem or is it not? Is it something we have to deal with or is it not? Next slide, please. If there's an issue and a person has a break in their, dis in their employment, disability insurance is an important area that needs to be looked at. Now, many employers will have disability insurance available to you, and this would be under short-term disability. They also may have a long-term disability program. These are different than Social Security disability, which usually requires a person to be off work for six months or longer. Uh, under short-term disability, it may go into effect right away, that is, within days of not being able to, to work. Long-term disability usually goes on for uh, a person has to be off work for six months and there will be a transition on to short-term or long, uh, Social Security disability if that is necessary. I'm not going to go through all of these, but here are the four areas that, and when you consider the disability insurance, that uh, if, if that's a, a likely st a strategy or path you have to follow. For all, uh, disability insurance is not an entitlement program. It's a contracted benefit that that employer pays for. Now, you also may be paying for this. If it's a voluntary program that's offered at your your work site, you may be paying for it, uh, or a certain amount of uh, your wages may be pulled off uh, or drawn off to pay for that particular benefit. But many employers will pay that as a benefit for their for their employees. Understand the rules. Uh, understand clearly how much time you're available. It's available on short-term disability. Typically, it's from three to six months. Sometimes it's less. Um, it's usually never more. Uh, so make sure you understand the, the reasons uh, 
the, the, the latitude of the length of time you're involved. Long disability usually starts at six months and may go up to two years. At that point in time, then definitions of disability will change. That is, it may be that you can't do your permanent, the job you're in now, that definition may be that disability, you can, can't do any job. And that makes a difference now in terms of the relationship with your employer. All you need to understand how long you will be stayed employed or connected to that employer. Some employers have a two-year limit. If you're off work for two years, then you're, all, you're not hired here anymore. You're not employed here anymore. And the employer is shortening that to a year. And even some employers have, if you're off for six months, you're no longer employed after that six months. We'll take a look at the pre-existing conditions. Most, most uh, uh, disability benefits, uh, private disability benefits, have a one-year pre-existing period. That is, uh, that if you're treated prior to the, uh, uh, the, uh, the disabling condition, before the insurance, it may have some impact on that. From that standpoint, understand the pre-existing conditions. Secondly, uh, look at the job accommodations. Almost every employer I've worked at, I've worked for, will offer accommodations, and most insurers will be your advocate on that. They want you working. It's not to their advantage to have you off work. So make sure that that disability insurer is your partner, not your uh, not adversary. Uh, I, and so from that standpoint, uh, make sure that disability insurer is going to be partnering with you to work with you and, and they be your advocate with the employer in terms of helping them to understand what job accommodations are, are, are possible. There are a lot of resources out there about job uh, accommodations, and we'll share some of those at the end of my presentation. And then finally, on the return to on the disability insurance, almost every disability carrier has some type of return to work incentives. That is, that they'll be able to pay for partial disability. They'll be able to pour, uh, pour, provide you different benefits if you're able to work and return to work. So pay attention to those. It's not an all or nothing on and going back to work. That they have the insurer offers a, re, uh, a return to work incentives that are possible. Next slide, please. Uh, private disability is a direct goes directly into uh, Social Security disability through the Social Security Administration. And so from that standpoint, the long-term disability is usually the bridge. That is, after you've been on short-term disability for six months, three to six months, a long-term disability benefit will kick in. But you have to make sure that that's available. But that's usually the bridge to Social Security disability. So what you need to be able to do there is understand the rules and regulations of how to move on to disability. In many cases, the employer will work with you as you go on long-term disability to get you ready for Social Security disability because they're anticipating that if you're off work for six to seven, eight months, the likelihood of you going on Social Security is going to be fairly high. So they're going to want you to start planning and moving in that particular direction. So from that standpoint, they'll be able to be a support group to help you do that. Now, the, the, the definition of disability will change when you go on Social Security. It will be different than what you have under the private a disability contract, and so you're going to need to be aware of that and be a good consumer of the disability, the Social Security Disability Program. Now, if you do go on Social Security Disability, they do have also return work incentives uh, that will protect your Medicare benefits, to protect other health care benefits, and also will help you make a transition back to work. What we know is once a person goes on Social Security Disability, the likelihood of them going back to work is very, very low. And so from the standpoint, you're going to want to try to sustain your employment as long as possible before using the Social Security disability um, process and, and that particular benefit, that particular insurance. So keep that in mind. And I guess as you build that return to work, uh, that return to work um, uh, plan, focus on the capacity to maintain your employment as long as possible. Make sure you're able to realign that job demands in, that support your particular work capacities. And to be a good consumer and understand the disability insurance benefit, both from your employment and then that transition onto Social Security if at some point in time it appears that the likelihood of you continuing full-time employment is just not possible. Next slide, please. And in terms of the, the useful DI questions or disability insurance questions, once again, make sure you understand eligibility. And that is, am 
I, in fact, uh, covered under my employer's LTD and LTD uh, policy? Uh, oftentimes, there may be subtle changes. There may be, if there's breaks in employment, especially pay attention to that because sometimes when a person moves from full-time to part-time work, that can have an impact on their eligibility for benefits. Be very conscious of pre-existing conditions, that is, the nature of the, t the amount of time you've had the symptoms and have they, have they been identified, have they been recognized, and would they be in some way make you ineligible for getting the benefits uh, uh, with a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. And then finally, the, the actual benefit itself, how long it is, how much it is, uh, and, and be sure that it fits within uh, the certain jurisdictions you are. Uh, certain states have certain different types of benefits, uh, and such as California, Hawaii, New Jersey, and that they have temporary short-term disability programs offered by the state that you might be eligible for. And then finally, the last two are, are financials. Uh, make sure that you understand what the, the expected monthly benefits are. Those are specifically identified. Those are not hidden. What we find is that people that don't know this haven't asked, or they've not paid attention, or they haven't read up on it, because these benefits are not arbitrary. They are designed to be part of, an, of the program and are defined by negotiation, and they have a specific, of, uh, a specific percentage of of a person's salary. That may reach anything from 60% to 100%, depending on what the employer has developed or agreed to with that disability insurer. And then finally, uh, and there's going to be a lot of talk about this on future programs, is the overall impact of benefits in terms of income tax. Uh, it's always important to understand the relationship between that short-term and long-term disability benefits uh, as to its uh, taxation uh, as income. Uh, it's difficult to offer that up as a recommendation other than be aware of it, understand it, especially in the various states where you might have, uh, there might be variations that you might not be involved with. And so that, these are important questions that we think uh, are uh, important to ask as uh, the overall sustaining of employment and making a decision whether to leave work or not based on uh, a myriad of uh, options. And the final sl slide I'd like to leave you with uh, are actually two slides, but they're, they're summarizing work health resources. And they're uh, resources that you as an individual that they may be in a predicament of dealing with work and health issues that you should be accessing uh, and making available to yourself and having access to. And we just put them on here. Uh, I'm not going to go through them, but just recognize them that if you're looking for accommodations, there are just a number of sites that can be very, very specific in taking a job that you might have, whether it's a clerical position, manufacturing, service, construction, uh, whatever it may be, they have already thought out ways of creating various accommodations. Uh, the idea about retraining and re-education and employment supports can certainly be looked at by the state vocational agencies. The vocational rehab, rehab agencies are intimately connected to Social Security disability programs. And so if you're going to go on Social Security disability and that's part of your plan or part of your anticipated direction, they are going to ask you to talk to the VR agency to see if you can, if there are other ways that they can help you uh, to maintain your employment. There are various Department of Labor and federal uh, sites, that, uh, websites that can help in, in gathering information and and certainly one of the things I'm focusing on is making sure that as the decisions you make, that they're informed and done in collaboration. And this particular uh, site, the Informed Medical Decision Foundation, based in Boston, has a, a large number of what they call decision-making aids that can help a person, a physician, uh, the individual, the patient, the person that's dealing with the disability, the health care issue, gives them a, a, a well-thought-out series of uh, decision points that they need to be conscious of, where to gather information to seek out the best path to make the most informed decision. And the last slide is just represents the, the gathering of information for disability insurance. These are the websites that are, uh, are readily available to individuals to, uh, to get more informed about disability insurance, um, what it means, the questions to ask, uh, who to work with, uh, things like that. But as I mentioned before, disability insurance uh, on the private side is uh, going to go through the employer if, unless it's part of a state program. 
Uh, but the same thing is, goes on with there. You need to understand the, the, the eligibility criteria, the benefit structure, the uh, requirements for work, and, 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 and how it plays into various employment uh, or breaks in employment. And with, I'm hoping that you, you walk away from this particular discussion that now some very specific steps that can be done to uh, bring forward a, an opportunity to, first of all, prevent that work health predicament or getting stuck, uh, but also if you do find yourself in that predicament where there are difficulties in matching up job demands with your, with your particular work capacities, that there are solutions to it that you can bring forward and that you can look for the collaboration with your employer, your healthcare provider, your disability insurer in a way that will allow you to solve this predicament in a way that will allow you to sustain your employment as long as possible. The opportunity to share these points of view with you. Good. Thank you so much, Dr. Mitchell. I have to share with all of you on the line that I've been working in the field of disability for 13 years now, and until I met Dr. Mitchell, did I really ever hear anybody talking about staying on the job for as long as you can. Typically, what I heard was a very kind of negative spin on let's talk about getting people on to disability, meaning Social Security disability, other than let's talk about utilizing all of the resources that are out there and available around job accommodations and using assistive technology to help people stay on the job as long as possible. We're to the next slide so we can hear from a peer perspective, but if you do have any questions for Dr. Mitchell, now would be the time to send them into the Q&A as we're going to have him for just minutes longer, and then he's going to be on his way. So if you have any questions for him, please send them in now. So we have joining us today Nicole Lamel. She's a writer, activist, and a woman living with MS. She has a great blog called MyNewNormal.com, and we have the pleasure of having her with us today so that she can share a little bit about her experience in having that moment in time um, where she realized perhaps work wasn't going to be um, going to be an option for her much longer and she's going to share with us a little bit about how she made her decisions and whether or not she had had access to this kind of information that you received today. Nicole, thanks so much for joining us. Hi, thank you for having me. It's funny because I went through this process point by point by point. I went to the short-term disability that led to the long-term disability that led to Social Security. And I, it, want, it never it never occurred to me that I could stay on my job longer than I did. It never occurred to me to ask my employers to help me. I was too afraid. I was too scared. I didn't want anybody to know that I couldn't do my job, which was, which I couldn't do my job physically, um, cognitively, or the dexterity in my hands. I couldn't do it. So I figured that means I couldn't work there. So... Um, I on short term disability. That was that what I thought was next the next step. I didn't think of any else. So it's good to hear these things. I would have had it a couple of years before now, but um I kind of um reimagined my life now as a blogger and actress and things like that. But still wanted to know. Um I am on long term disability with my through my company. And uh, but I know I have, I have a, a cannet which is five hundred thousand dollars. Using it conservative, conservatively, but I know that you know one day I'm going to hit that cap. And so I'm wondering how hard it's going to be for me to find long-term disability now that I do have a, a pre-existing condition of MS. Uh, that's one of my big questions um, because I went to one company and they said, well, no, we don't. We don't assure you. And long-term disability has been my savior, for lack of better words, because, um, you know, it allows my husband to um, be here with me, and we will get, um, like, a little stipend, so to speak, the company that I'm with now, but they're ending their program. I like to think that it has nothing to do with me, but ending it, needless to say. Um, so now I blog. Um, what I do now, since I have so much time, and you know, I'm just 37, but I'm living like so much older. But anyway, that's another story. But thank you for this opportunity to share. And 
everybody has the opportunity, please get long-term disability. Um, it, it, it's, it's just like a game changer. Um, Nicole, thank you so much for sharing um, your, your, a bit of your story with us. And we did ha we have a, a slide for all of you out there on Nicole's um, blog, My New Normal. One of the things, Nicole, you mentioned really aligned with one of the comments that Dr. Mitchell made was that mm -hmm. as you progress in, in with your illness and as your, mm -hmm. your expectations for your life changes, you sometimes have to realign what you're going to do and... And Definitely. I like that you've had the chance to realign what you do um, from being somebody in the healthcare field to being somebody in this online world of being a blogger and an activist and a writer. So thank you right. so much. Thank you. So I'm going to take some questions, and we're going to start with one from Lisa. Her question is, um, to Dr. Mitchell, how have people with disabilities sabotaged ourselves when it comes to work? financial health. We can change what we do, not necessarily the outcomes. Yeah, I think that's one of the probably the more frustrating parts that I when I'm working with individuals is when they sabotage the process themselves. It goes back to those four barriers I talked about, the, the ambiguity, the ambivalence, the resistance, and the fear. And I think that's what uh, an individual will sabotage themselves is they will be afraid to do something. They will, uh, they will, they will be um, ignorant of the process. They will be. And I use the term ignorant in the fact is that they may not be informed about what their options are, and that lack of curiosity, that lack of interest, uh, and it may not lack of interest, but lack of, of self confidence, or a lack of energy to to pursue it. Uh, and I think those are those are some of the factors where I, I believe a person sabotages their the ability to sustain employment over. Over, over time. And, and what I found is that if you control what you can control, the outcomes do change. Uh, and so from that standpoint, I, I think that's why I encourage a person is, is that if you can uh, change your behavior and uh, not get caught up in those four barriers, that uh, the outcomes do in fact uh, come, come out differently. Our next question is from Lisa. She says, my planning horizon is 30 minutes from now. <laughs> I do look to next month and next year, and I definitely am a head in the clouds kind of woman. How can I start bouncing between all of these time frames to focus on what I need to be accountable for? Well, the first thing is to define what you're accountable for, and that's really part of the planning process. Uh, I admire your ability to uh, have such a range from the in the clouds to, to 30 minutes from now. But you're right, when a person uh, bounces back and forth, that can be very frustrating for everybody. And so what our, my suggestion is usually is to find those things that you're accountable for, things that have to be done. Uh, and, and you can regulate those, or not regulate, but calibrate them in relationship to this week, this month, today, uh, or a year from now. Uh, and then, uh, then you can then assign resources. You can assign priorities. You can define the energy that's required to do that. But it's, it's really creating a plan, and that plan uh, aligns it with what's possible uh, in terms of what you what's important to you. Uh, and so, from that standpoint, it, it's a, it's a part of discipline uh, that people have. Uh, and, and what you describe has nothing to do with MS. It has nothing to do with cancer. It, it's it's the way people tend to do things. And, uh, and so, from that standpoint, but oftentimes people that have health issues say, "I can't make, I can't think about next week because I have to think about tomorrow." Well, what is it about tomorrow you can you have to deal with, and then what do you have to deal with next week that's going to have an impact on tomorrow? And that's that's what we try to do: is make it as practical, make it as focused, and um, and work it from that, starting in increments. Question comes from Bryant. The question is, I have PPMS, or primary progressive MS, and plan to work as long as possible, but it's a lot different than RRMS. How is PPMS different as it relates to staying to, at work? Well, the way you look at it is, what what are the potential features in terms of the uh, the uh, remissions and exacerbations, the, the level of change, the level of, of uh, duration of 
of the of the impairments involved. That's usually what is the critical factor in terms of its impact on, on, on the various jobs. So uh, if there's a pattern, I buy the pattern. Uh, and if that pattern then has some predictability to it, then you can uh, work around that in terms of uh, schooling or training. One of the more frustrating things is when someone says, you know, I can't do my job, but I want to go get retrained. And they start their education retraining program, but then they have ups and downs and they can't participate in the training program or maintain it. One thing we have in our favor right now is the internet and, and online education programs. So it gives a lot more flexibility of doing things that you don't have to be in classes all the time. You can do it from home or anything like that. But the, being able to track the ups and downs and, and, and then aligning your time and, and activities both in the short and long term to that will at least be a start. So that ties in nicely with our next question and our last question, which is from Shana. She said, I'm newly diagnosed with MS. And I got off my, from my job shortly after my diagnosis due to downsizing. I do work temp jobs, but I would like to look for employment in this market, which with a disability is difficult to do. What should be my first step? Don't panic. Uh, is, is my first advice. Uh, uh, that, that's the important thing is keep your head about yourself uh, in terms of uh, you've experienced some bad luck, uh, obviously, with uh, the multiple sclerosis diagnosis and then getting laid off. Um, so the, the strength that I would suggest your first step is to take a look at as you if you were downsized without MS, and what would you be doing? What would be your next steps? What would you be looking at? Where would you be looking at for employment based on your skills, your experience, your knowledge, your your overall capacities to contribute in an area? Then. And begin to understand the realities of the the disease. What what difference will it make? Uh, what needs to be shared? Uh, what needs to be introduced at the time of uh, of discussion with the client, with the uh, with the employer? Uh, that's always a big question, and I don't have a real answer for you on that. It should be shared at the point of a, an initial interview. Um, uh, there are different thoughts about that uh, in terms of introducing it to the person. Um, to job, if it makes a difference in terms of the type of work you need, the type of accommodations. Obviously, if accommodations are needed, those need to be reported and identified. Will that make a difference in terms of how the employer will see you? Maybe, maybe not. It's hard to say. But the step, and that's I'm going to respond to your question, is act like you, have, you don't have MS at this point in time or no diagnosis. What would you do, be doing to get reemployed after being downsized? And then apply the overlay of the, well, how the MS may have, may fit with that or impact that, then you can make some decisions as to how to approach an employer, um, and uh, and uh, that will get, at least get you started. Just to add one more thing to that, you know, because this is a series on financial wellness, we want to remind you that as you look at what your needs are, don't forget your financial needs. Most of us, when we look for a job, we think about what do I need to cover my budget. And so sometimes in the disability field, that gets lost because we're so focused on um, individual capacity to do certain jobs based on a disability, but you don't want to lose that perspective. We have one more question, and that is, if you could re recommend one place to start in getting back into the work field, where would you start? Start where, where you left off. That's good. That's about, that's about the best thing is... Uh, uh, and, and see where you where you fit within that. Why you're unemployed at this point in time, or you want, want to get employed if you're and have not been employed before, uh, is uh, um, uh, start where you left off, and then begin to determine is that where you need to be. Uh, and if not, uh, then that's when you can be, create then options as to where do you want to go. And that's based on not the MS at this point in time, but your values, your interests, your skills, where you want to be. Uh, what your capabilities are, and then as you begin to define those, then look at the nature and scope of how the MS may have an impact on this. If related to endurance or strength or mobility uh, or things like that, then you want to be able to really thinking if those jobs that you're in areas you want to focus on have that relationship to that, then those are probably not going to be winners for you. So the idea is to see where you want to go and then align it with your physical capacities and then you can move forward and, and, and start the process moving moving uh, in the direction you want it to go. 
Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Mistral, for your time today. We can't tell you how much we appreciate your expertise and your willingness to share it with all of us here on the line. So for those of you who have some specific questions about return to work, we're going to provide another few resources, so hold tight. We're, just, we're going to get to those slides in just a minute. Let's talk about some suggested next steps. You got a lot of great information today, and sometimes you get so much information that it's hard to boil it down into a few great next step suggestions, so we want to provide some for you. First is to consider Dr. Mitchell's initial question. At the very beginning of the webinar, he said, find your work health predicament. He mentioned that when doing so, you should consider what is important to you, what has to change, what can change, and to try to define for yourself what your work health life is going to look like. So we challenge you to do that, to sit down with your ones, with your support team, and think about your own work work health predicament, and really think about what is truly important to me, social expectations, and what are my expectations. The second step we suggest is to develop an accurate picture of your functional capacities, meaning your physical, cognitive, and emotional capacities as they are today, and identify gaps between your job demands and your work capacities. I remember that Dr. Mitchell gave a grid that showed this. It was on slide 19, if you want to go back to it. This gives you a chance to think about the functional capacities you need for your job and where your current capacities lie in relation to them. I say that many of you asked for advice on where to go for work, and I'm going to provide some resources that will be available in your local community. But one of the things that can happen when you go to support for work, for finding jobs, Job, is that you can have individuals who start to identify what your functional capacities are, what the capacities of the job are going to be, and where the gaps are. And so utilizing Dr. Mitchell's approach, finding the gaps for yourself first, really puts you in a position of empowerment when you go and seek out support for finding a job or for keeping a job. If you've never done this practice, I imagine some pieces of it will be very difficult difficult, but it's still a wonderful um, opportunity for you to make an accurate description of your current abilities for yourself before anybody else decides them for you. So that's the second step. The third step is determine one way that you, you can st take one step towards making a change plan. If you recall, Dr. Mitchell advised that you think about your work health predicament identify your capacities and the gaps related to the work they do, and then you make a change plan. So it may mean that you need to gather more information or use some of the resources we provide to explore accommodations or even speak with your disability insurance provider or your employer. The point of this third step is for you to do your best to have really good information to make decisions about what you're going to do about your work whether you're going to stay or go, what your opportunities may be to stay on the job with accommodations or assistive technology. But as, as Nicole mentioned, to not sit there and think, well, if my function, if functional capacity is decreasing, then it must mean I can't keep my job. So this is a challenge for you to try to gather as much good information as you can so that you can make an informed decision that meets your personal values and your personal functional capacity. So we hope that you will set a goal to complete items one, two, and three over the next few months. And we're going to reach out to you to share your experience with us um, so that we can find out how you did or if you needed more information. Or It kind of helps us to form the next set of, of webinars. But it also gives us a chance to hear back from you on what you did with this, this information. So let's talk about some of the resources. These mirror many of the resources that Dr. Mitchell provided, but for those of you on the line that are still getting, um, that are still kind of new to this disability world, I'll make sure you know what the purpose of these different organizations are and how you connect with them. The first ones are about accommodations. So the ADA National Network is a national network of um, entities that are funded by the federal government provide ADA information to anybody who requests it. It's provided at no 
charge and say uh, you, your employer is curious about the ADA, they can call in to the ADA National Network and they're not whistleblowers. So they can call in and feel safe that they're not going to be reported for um, not currently abiding by the ADA. Maybe they're doing their best. Let's hope they're doing their best. So the ADA National Network also has on their trainings, it has information on accommodations. It just has a wealth of information. They also, when you go up to their website, they also have a hotline. So you can use the line or you can call and talk to them. Now the Job Accommodation Network. Again, this is a national entity that's funded by the federal government. And specifically, they try to find um, answers to accommodation questions. So if you think that you need a specific accommodation, or you can recognize I'm having this limit capacity in this functional area that is required for my job, but you don't know what the accommodation might look like for that, then I would say call JAM, the Job Accommodation Network. They would be the entity who would be poised and ready and have a mission to figure out for you what that accommodation may look like. You have a lot of experience in it. So it's most likely that the accommodation you need um, is one that they've suggested before. The one under accommodations are independent living resource centers. Every community has an independent living resource center. They're also sometimes called centers for independent living. It really depends on the community. So an independent living resource center has several things that they do. One is stated in their name. They are there to help you maintain your independence in living in the community. They also help with employment issues, can help with advocacy, if you need advocacy in any area related to your MS. They are a really great resource, and I find as I answer people's questions that most people aren't aware of this resource, but they are a free resource available in every local community. The next sources are maintaining and obtaining employment. Employment. So some folks talked about, I um, I want to stay on the job longer, or maybe I need to start looking for a job. And I would say a great first step as far as receiving service would be the State Vocational Rehabilitation Agency. State has an agency that is responsible for assisting individuals with disabilities in obtaining maintaining employment. And what means is that if you're on the job now, but your disability or your MS is starting to impact you, you can talk to your state vocational rehabilitation agency about what services might they provide. Sometimes it can be they can cover the cost of accommodations. Sometimes they can cover retraining. Sometimes they can cover people going back to school. Uh, can cover, sometimes they can cover um, for those of you on the line that are starting to look at accessible vehicles, if you're working, State Vocational Rehabilitation Agency may be able to cover the cost of making your vehicle modified. You can cover a lot of different services. I gave you a website, and when you get to that website, you'll click on State Agency's contact information, but you can also Google for your state vocational rehabilitation, and you'll likely get right to the site. The process of participating in this kind of service means you will go and meet with the State Vocational Rehabilitation Agency. You may ask to sign a plan for employment, but in the states, the services are free. Um, unless you have a, a high income, there may be some costs. It's a, it's a great first step and one that I would highly recommend to anybody who is seeking to either stay on the job or to make a return to work. So under obtaining employment, the job centers, which are now called America's Job Network, they're also available in every community, and we gave you the link to the service locator. One-stop centers are quite a bit more anonymous than working with your state vocational rehabilitation agency. Anyone is able to walk into a one-stop center and receive return-to-work supports. The support you get there may be as simple as looking at job leads, or you could take classes. You can um, end up getting more uh, focused services, more intensive services is what they call them there. 
depending on what your needs are and what they determine um, to be able to provide for you. This is another entity that does provide some return to work training, meaning they may help you to completely switch fields. It just depends on what you're looking for and what your specific local one-stop is able to provide. And I also provided for you this federal hiring of people with disabilities. There is a significant push within the federal government to hire individuals with disabilities. And so I gave you, um, it's called Schedule A hiring. And you can better understand how you apply under Schedule A and what the process will be. If you haven't considered this, it could be a very viable option for you as the federal government is set apart to be the basically the premier employer. They are the ones who set the rules around the ADA, and so we as a community expect them to abide by them um, point, as an example to other employers. Anything that you heard today you'd like to get more information on or your personal situation you don't feel was really touched upon, maybe there's some other things you're interested in, I invite you to reach out to me. Um, email is really the best, but you're welcome to also call me if you prefer. Again, I'm Elizabeth Jennings, and I work for National Disability Institute. And we hope that today you got some good information on how you might look at your work health predicament and think about prolonging and finding the supports that you need to stay on the job. This is our financial wellness series sponsored by Accorda Therapeutics. I hope that you will join us again in just a few weeks for our next webinar, which will be on Social Security Disability Insurance. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Have a great day.